Agora At the Left Hand of God by Robert E. Svoboda Vimalananda's Dedication for this book Dedicated to the One who is the source of life, the dynamic cosmic energy which pervades the entire universe perennially, the fountainhead of supreme joy, divinity and magnanimity, my mother Tara. Vimalananda, the subject of this book, designed the cover and dictated to the author the following regarding its symbolic meaning. Gora is darkness, the darkness of ignorance. Agora means light, the absence of darkness. Under the tree of knowledge is Anagori, a follower of the path of Agora. He has gone beyond ignorance thanks to the flame of knowledge which billows from the funeral pyre. The funeral pyre is the ultimate reality, a continual reminder that everyone has to die. Knowledge of the ultimate reality of death has taken the agori beyond the eight snares of existence, lust, anger, greed, delusion, envy, shame, disgust and fear, which bind all beings the Agori plays with the human skull, astonished by the uselessness of limited existence. Knowing the whole world to be within him, though he is not in the world. His spiritual practices have awakened within him the power of Kundalini, which takes the form of the goddess dancing on the funeral pyre, Smashantara. He is bewildered to think that all is within him, not external to him, that he sees it not with the physical eyes, but with the sense of perception. The flame of knowledge that within the flame of knowledge is that which preserves life, the eternal flame, the supreme ego, the motherhood of God, which creates the whole Maya of the universe, and thanks only to whose grace the Agori has become immortal. The contents of this book have been encapsulated on its cover. The breath, the power, the majesty of the divine delirium of Agora. Preface My teacher, the Agori Vimalananda, spent many years perfecting his knowledge of Tantra and its advanced discipline, Agora. He distilled his experiences and presented me with the essence. My comprehension of Tantra is due entirely to his instruction and is redolent of the influence of his personality. Tantra is the science of personality. Just as Ayurveda was promulgated by the ancient sages of India as a truly holistic way to maintain the physical body, and just as Ashtanga Yoga is meant to optimize one's spiritual nature, Tantra is the mental science, a meta-psychology, a method of explaining the mind and developing the range of one's perceptions. It is said that the state of undifferentiated unity is the only absolute reality and that the cosmos possesses only a relative reality because it is not permanent and unchanging. The universe possesses all possible qualities and attributes and each being within the universe possesses a limited number of qualities and attributes. Personality is the self-identification of the ego with a set of attributes. All beings possess ego and therefore all beings have personalities. The cosmos herself possesses the ultimate personality, the supreme expression of the totality of manifested experience, the Adi Shakti or Adya. To state that humans, animals, trees and flowers possess their own individualities and idiosyncrasies is less apt 
to induce controversy than to assert that even beings who are disembodied or which are embodied but are less individualized than we also possess personality. The issue of disease is a good example. Disease are beings with parasitical intentions. Some have collective bodies like worms, bacteria or viruses, just as bees and ants show signs of collective consciousness. Other diseases, bereft of their own bodies, arise within organ systems of some plant or animal due to metabolic malfunctions. When the intruding personality differs significantly in sophistication of organization from its host, physical disease is likely, for then the attacker's ego will be inf insufficiently developed to assume control of all essential physiological functions. Conversely, when the animal of a dead human enters the body of a living human, it will feel right at home and the disease will display predominantly mental symptoms such as altered values and habit patterns. Whatever the intruder, cure is the expelling of the alien and the return of the normal personality. An individual's immunity exists on the physical levels in white blood cells and in antibodies and on the mental level in the, de in the degree of personality integration. The cause of immunity is the ego's power of self-identifying with the body and the mind. The word ego is used here not in a Freudian sense but as an indicator for the force of individual identity in the organism. The stronger the self-identification the greater the immunity to attack from another personality which might usurp some areas of the ego's domination. Every cell is ceaselessly remembered by the ego as being part of the organism. When the organism dies, the cells are free in the absence of the ego's grip to go their separate ways. If a cell rebels against the ego's domination and seeks to proliferate itself into a new personality, the result is cancer. Be the predator external or internal, disease is its onslaught on one's personality. According to Tantra, everyone is ill who is doomed to live with a limited personality. Only those who go beyond time, space and causation to become immortal can be said to be truly in harmony with the cosmos and therefore truly healthy, since health is derived both from internal balance and from harmony with the environment. Hence one significant area of tantric research has always been methods for prolonging one's life. In one sense, the added years are significant mainly because they indicate the degree of successful achievement of the rituals. Ayurveda is also concerned with longevity, but its approach is to strengthen the individual's innate personality. Yoga recognizing the essential impermanence of the human personality seeks to efface it entirely to permit one to return directly to the unlimited absolute. Tantra aims to replace the limited personality with an unlimited permanent one. An individual may fail to become internal but may in the course of tantric practice accumulate sufficient energy, shakti, to obtain some extraordinary power called a siddhi. Wisely used, siddhis can accelerate one's spiritual evolution. Commercialized, siddhis bind, down, bind one down more firmly to the wheel of cause and effect. One simple sort of siddhi involves the collection of one particular herb 
at the astro astrologically appropriate moment with the appropriate ritual. After further preparation, such plants can bestow super physical powers on their users. The plant species selected is one known to have an affinity for the sort of power desired. The ritual draws that power into the plant at the moment when it is available in the cosmos to be tracked. The herb's own personality is then overshadowed by the personality of the force drawn into it. Metals and gems are also used in tantric alchemy. Indian alchemists, like their Western counterparts, searched for the Philosopher's Stone, the way to turn base metal into gold. While exoterically, this base metal referred to iron, bronze, brass and copper, the esoteric reference was to the transmutation of the base metal of the individual's limited consciousness into the gold of enlightenment, a state of unlimited consciousness. An alternative meaning suggests the transmutation of the base metal of the body into the gold of immortality via the touchstone of Amrita, the elixir of life. It is said that the herbal based preparations can prolong one's life for 400 to 500 years, but that, the, but that through the use of mercury there, there is no end to how long one can live. Mercury is regarded as the ultimate metal because it is a soul element which can be brought to life. Repeated herbal applications and treatments with fire bring the mercury to life. It is then treated like a child. Its appetite is awakened and it is fed. At an appropriate point, it is sacrificed. The personality thus created is thereupon liberated to display its attributes and with the assistance, one can create gold, fly in the air, or live eternally. Or rather, the new personality can take over one's body and live eternally through it. Mercury, which is less efficiently prepared, cannot bestow immortality, but can cure disease and increase longevity. Insoluble preparations of mercury and sulfur are widely used in Ayurvedic medicine. Such compounds are byproducts of alchemical experimentation. Immortality is a desirable goal in the context of the Indian belief in reincarnation. If one has a long list of karmic connections to be lived through, it is infinitely more convenient to live through them all in one lifetime rather than to be forced to endure rebirth again and again. Herbs and minerals are only two methods for achieving immortality, however. Another method is practiced by agoris, tantrics who have superseded all ritual limitations. When they find themselves near death, any good yogi will know of his impending death six months in advance, as his prana or life force begins to flow out of his body. Agoris deliberately leave their bodies and enter the bodies of corpses, taking them over and making them live for as long as they please until they decide to change bodies again. Most dead personalities cannot move about so freely on their own and some tantrics worship in the graveyards and, ch and charnel grounds simply to catch hold of human spirits, to force them to perform work. This is also a sort of siddhi. The sort of work possible depends upon the power of the captured personality. This method produces quick results, but it is dangerous, for a minor error in the ritual may result in insanity, death or worse. Other ethereal beings who never took human form can also be bound by Tantra and their tremendous power harnessed. The most 
Pusant are the deities, personifications of various cosmic forces. The ultimate Siddhi is control of Adhya, the personification of the entire cosmos. Essential to the production of any Siddhi are Mantra, Yantra and Tantra. In the journey towards Siddhi, Mantra is the energy which moves your vehicle, the Yantra, according to the roadmap. Tantra. In an industrial analogy, the finished product, Siddhi, emerges when the raw material, Mantra, is fed into the milling machine's Yantra according to a fixed process, Tantra. A Mantra is a collection of sounds. When pronounced, their vibrations provide energy to the Yantra. Sounds appear on the electromagnetic spectrum as one variety of energy which can be manipulated by the tantric. There are three main types of mantra. A. Descriptive, usually in Sanskrit. These mantras describe either the process undergone, the desired goal or both. The second. Meaningless. Aggregations of sounds which have no known meaning to in any human language. And the third, bijas, individual nasalized syllables. A mantra is a collection of sounds. When pronounced, their vibrations provide the energy to the yantra. Sound appears on the electromagnetic spectrum as one variety of energy which can be manipulated by the tantric. There are three main types of mantra. One, descriptive, usually in Sanskrit. These mantras describe either the process undergone, the desired goal or both. Second, meaningless, aggregations of sounds which have no known meaning in any human language. The third, Bijas, individual nasalized syllables. Bija means seed, and these seed sounds produce fruit according to the Bija Vriksha Nyaya, or the law of seed and tree. The frequent repetition of these Bijas eventually result in a sort of standing wave permanently energizing either an external yantra or some area of the aspirant's brain, resulting in the continuous production of a specific effect, one which is coherent with the personality invoked. Four types of vani or speech exist for the pronunciation of mantra. The first, vaikari, vocal speech. Second, Madhyama, nasalized speech. The third, Pashyanti, purely mental repetition. The fourth, Para, telepathic speech, in which the only intention, but not the sound, is conveyed. The more subtle the speech, the deeper its effect on both the individual and the surrounding environment. Just as a laser produces coherent light, a human brain can produce coherent energy when a single frequency, bija, is selected and is amplified appropriately with a yantra and tantra. The yantra is the crucible in which the herb, mineral, animal or human is prepared through the mantra's energy. The yantra contains the energy, reflecting it back upon itself until it can accumulate to that point when, as in a laser, it, of its own accord, projects itself. The projection assumes the form of the deity appertaining to the bija repeated. When mantras other than bijas are employed, the energy will continue to accumulate until it is used or is otherwise discharged. Here the yantra acts something like a capacitor. Yantras are frequently diagrams drawn on birch bark, 
crystals or copper plates or they can be drawn with powder or sand. Images may be used as yantras but the best yantra is said to be the human body. Tantras are the three main varieties according to the aspirant's capabilities. External, eternal and mixed. The Pashu or animalistic type of aspirant is by nature greatly attached to the enjoyment of external sense objects and so, and so should perform external worship to control these urges to outwardness. The Divya or divine type tends to be introverted and need not bother with external ritual. These aspirants require an antaryaga internal sacrificial rites. The Vira or heroic type can perform both external and internal worship competently with thorough attention to detail. Every day life becomes a sacrificial rite for a Vira with each act an act of worship hidden at all times from the casual observer. For a Vira the entire world is a graveyard filled with the dead. A true tantric re regards every human being, including himself, as already dead, since the fact of birth makes death inevitable. For a tantric, and even more so for an agori, the entire world is his playground and his temple. Still, rituals which make use of literal corpses and skulls are available for those who wish to get quick results. Such practices are part of Varma Marga or the left hand path which is the violent counterpart of the Dakshina Marga or the right hand path. The Dakshina Marga is meant for those who seek steady progress with reduced danger of setbacks. The Varma Marga is described as Shigra, Ugra and Tivra or fast, terrible and intense. On this path, the chances for catastrophe are great unless a powerful guru's protection is provided. The sexual rituals which have made Tantra notorious as part of Varma Marga. The ritual in which sex appears is known as Panchamakara is actually of three types depending upon the class of the celebrant and in only one type does actual sexual intercourse occur. That version is meant only for tamasic people, tamas being mental inertia or dullness. The intensity of the five, pancha means five, articles of worship, meat, fish, parched grain, wine and sex overwhelms the dullness of the mind with stimulation. If the aspirin has been properly prepared, this increased mental energy can assist his or her spiritual evolution. An ill-prepared aspirant will be overcome by stimulation and will descend into debauchery. Rajasic people, rajas means mental activity, have active minds which must be properly channeled. They need less stimulation and more control and use ginger, radish, boiled as opposed to parched grain, coconut milk and flowers in their panchamakara. Sattvic people naturally enjoy ample sattva, balance of mind and alertness, and do not require external aids to worship. They utilize the meat of silence, the fish of breath control, the grain of concentration techniques, the wine of God intoxication and the coitus of one's ego with the absolute. The Sanskrit terminology used to describe the Panchamakara hides this meaning behind its exterior. For example, fish stands for breath control because one's two nostrils are referred to in yogic terminology as rivers since they are continuously flowing. The right is called the Ganga and the left is called the Yamuna. Just as the fish swim in rivers, the breath swims through the nostrils and holding the breath Kavala Kumbhaka is equivalent to eating the fish.
Panchamakara is only one of many tantric rituals, but it illustrates well a fundamental tantric concept, Bhutta Shuddhi. The physical universe is a permutation of five great elements, earth, water, air, fire and ether, equivalent respectively to the solid, liquid and gaseous states of matter, heat which transforms matter from one state to the other and the field in which all the activity takes place. To achieve universal harmony with these five elements must be harmonized. Panchamakara is a fast, intense way to do this. Meat stands for earth, fish for water, wine for fire, grain for air, and sex for ether. When one reaches the stage of balance in which these inputs cause no disequilibrium of consciousness or metabolism, it is much less likely that any other fluctuation in the five elements will cause disharmony and a state of health has been reached since health is balance and disease is imbalance. This health is infinitely more permanent than ordinary health. To deal with only five elements, though essential in every tantric sadhana, would be too mechanistic and tantric authorities advocate personification in accompaniment. Rather than seek to extirpate their emotions entirely as yogic practitioners do, tantrics magnify their emotions and transfer them entirely to a deity, a personified cosmic force. All the aspirant's natural propensities can spend themselves in this, in this devotee-deity relationship, avoiding suppression of all desires which might erupt later to disrupt the harmony. Thus Tantra insists, there is no mukti, freedom from delusion, without bhukti, enjoyment. Enjoyment refers to the acceptance of all phenomena which may occur to an individual, be they good, enjoyable, or bad, painful. The aspirant relies on the magnanimity of nature, personified as the deity, to protect and provide. Yoga and Vedanta aim directly at Mukti, which was appropriate in earlier ages when the mundane world was less demanding. Tantra is more practical for today's world. Ayurveda is meant for those who desire only Bhukti, or unrestricted sensory enjoyments. It was promulgated as a separate doctrine because many today cannot comprehend health spiritual aspects. The doctrine of Kundalini and the chakras is associated with that of the five great elements. When the elements have been thoroughly purified in an individual, then the Kundalini Shakti of a goddess in her own right has a free path upwards through the chakras to meet and mate with her Shiva in the brain. Each of the five low chakras is the seat of the subtle form of one element. And only when they are purified and harmonized can the Kundalini free herself from their grasp. Herbs can be useful to assist in this process, as can mercury. Even disembodied spirits can be useful since they churn the nervous system to the high pitch necessary to withstand the tremendous might of Kundalini, who is the individual equivalent of the cosmic Adhya. Each aspirant's perception of Kundalini will differ according to their innate emotional makeup, and therefore many forms of the goddess are, aware, are available for worship. Whatever the form, the aspirant must interact with Kundalini on a personal basis. Some treat her as a sister, some as a friend, advisor or wife. A few regard her as a 16-year-old daughter, and the Agoris treat her as a servant. But my teacher, Vimalananda, op opinioned that it is best to treat her as a mother. In her aspect as Adya, she is mother of all worlds and all beings. We emerge from her, exist in her, and eventually dissolve into her again. Moreover, a friend may fail you, a wife may quarrel with you, and a servant may rebel against you. 
but your mother will never desert you. Vimalananda told me, always sit in the, in the lap of the Divine Mother. Let her do everything for you. Rely on her totally and she will never forget, forsake you. If you try to do things on your own, you will fall and hurt yourself. Only she can take care of you. The greater your bhakti, devotional love, for her, the faster will be your progress. Bhakti is essential because she is really you. You are a minuscule part of her and you must love yourself and make progress. Even the masculine deities are all part of her. Whether the tantric aspirant worships a male or female deity depends on the guru, but the outcome will be the same. Kundalini will reunite with her Shiva. First mantra, yantra and tantra will be used to create the form of the deity in the aspirant's consciousness. Then the devotee and the deity will be together consciously, observing their stipulated relationship, son, mother, husband, wife or whatever. This is called Tanmayata. Eventually Tadrupata occurs in which all but a few vestiges of the devotee's original personality are eliminated and only the deity's personality remains. For the Panchamakara ritual to be successful, a couple who seek to perform it must first perfect Shiva Lata Mudra, a practice in which all sexual de desire is eliminated. The male identifies entirely with Shiva and the female with Shakti and his attitude must be held for three hours at a time to ensure success. The Tantra say Shivo Bhutva Shivam Yajet. First become Shiva and then you will be able to worship Shiva properly. When the self-identification with the deities is complete, then the consumption of fish, meat, grain, wine and sexual act are no longer acts of indulgence but become sacraments because the deities themselves partake directly. The merely curious have no business dabbling in Tantra but some so-called gurus in the, in the West encourage their half-baked followers to do so. Such self-delusive activity reinforces the crystallizations of the personality which prevents spiritual progress. Tantric rituals are sacrificial rites. Though herbs, minerals and animals are used as offerings, they are secondary to the true offering, the sacrifice of one's limited self into the sacrificial fires of penance. In the Panchamakara ritual, the female is the fire onto which the male offers semen, just as clarified butter is offered into orthodox fire worship. Ordinary sex is no sacrifice. When two people come together to copulate, they usually seek gratification for themselves, slaking off their, their lust. Perhaps indirectly they will try to satisfy their partners. Tantric sex becomes possible only when one has totally effaced one's own personality and offers oneself to the gratification of the deity, the universe incarnate. This is one reason Tantra has always been a closely guarded secret. The danger of abuse, abusable knowledge falling into the hands of the unworthy has limited its spread. One should never seek to practice classical Tantra without a guru because no Tantric texts exist which provide thorough accurate details of any ritual. Each text omits an essential step or includes false information and only through a guru can the reality handed down from teacher to disciple over generations be known. Even if pure Tantra is beyond the reach of most Westerners, the Tantric attitude has much to offer. To consider some of the topics already considered, Western psychology can learn much from the tantric concepts of personality and ego. The concept of individual constitution, not merely in the Ayurvedic sense of vata, pitta and kapha, but also in the mental, in the mental constitution of sattva, divya, rajas, vira and tamas, pashu. 
suggests that people can be categorized according to what sort of approach will suit their temperament and would therefore be more likely to work. Tantric herbal prep and mineral preparations are part of Ayurveda and can be elevated for their f efficacy. The whole physiology of sound and light can be revolutionized by examination of mantra and of visualization. Some of these tantric attitudes are already being employed in the West, perhaps unknowingly. For example, cancer patients are sometimes instructed to visualize uh, to encourage remission. One such visualization might be a school of piranha devouring the dead meat of the, tu of the tumor mass. This is tantric in nature, the sacrifice of an undesirable personality, the cancer, to an objectified projection of nature, the piranha. Such visualizations are often effective, but because they are in inherently combative, they are not useful for promoting health, which is non-aggressive, as they may be for cure. Tantra can suggest new and better visualizations which could positively increase the individual's stamina, vigor, and happiness while simultaneously eliminating the disease. Visualization can also be extended to other autoimmune diseases besides cancer. Since autoimmune disease occurs when the ego loses its ability to distinguish what is part of it, what is part of its organism and what is alien to it. Psychologically, this process is already being used in neuro-linguistic programming. Undesirable habits or personality quirks can be altered thereby without analysis, guilt or trauma, and new traits can be added. Because there is no limit for self-improvement, Tantra can be repeatedly employed to assist in adjustments. For those who are already relatively healthy, Tantra can create deeper levels of harmony and health. Immortality may be generally unobtainable, but a long life is not, for which good immunity is required. In Sanskrit, immunity, vyadi uh, shamtva, which means literally forgiveness of the disease. By improper lifestyle and attitudes, we create conditions in our bodies and minds which are agreeable to certain beings, which accept our unspoken invitation and move in. Most of us despise the disease without realizing that we have invited it to ourselves. When one learns to forgive oneself and to forgive the disease for its depredations, then the disease's return is effectively barred. Unfortunately, even the tantric attitude can be dangerous. As one accumulates power, the ego will balloon out unless the personality is continuously incinerated sim simultaneously. Hence, Tantra's insistence that power be objectified and personified. Since Tantric ritual can be used to create emotions which did not previously exist, perhaps adoption of the Tantric attitude can provide therapeutic for those many today who suffer from emotional paralysis. Hence Vermalananda's insistence on the greatness of motherly love. From the strictly spiritual point of view, a study of true Tantra would provide Westerners a proper perspective with which to consider their own spiritual practices. For example, they might begin to regard Kundalini with greater respect after learning of the effects of her complete awakening. Or, consider the millions who repeat mantras daily. Most are ignorant of the requirements for mantra city, and so will repeat the mantra sincerely for years with very little result. Whereas, with a little attention to tantric teachings, they can make quick progress by learning such things as number one, the location and the vocal apparatus where the mantra should be recited along with its proper pronunciation. Number two, the process of Bhutta Shuddhi and the practice of Nyasa, which prepares the body and mind to act as, as a fit receptacle for the deity. The third, Dhyana Vidhi, or specific visualization appropriate to the mantra. The fourth, 
the five great restrictions, which are reciting the mantra daily, the same number of times, at the same place, at the same time, with the same offering, while observing strict sexual continence during whatever period is set aside for this purpose. The fifth, the total number of repetitions required, which differs for each mantra, a hundred thousand is often cited, plus the appropriate number and variety of offerings to the five great elements. Though Tantra may sometimes seem hopelessly complex and impractical, one is unavoidably filled with awe at the amazing thoroughness and attention to detail which the ancient sages showed while promulgating the science. Even if it cannot be instantly commercialized or otherwise exploited in some mundane fashion, surely Tantra deserves appreciation for its very existence. The greatest benefit of the study of Tantra and Agora is perhaps an enhanced appreciation for motherliness. The doctor who cannot take on a motherly attitude towards his patients is a mere pill pusher. My teacher ins insisted that all males should learn motherly love. Tantra is the worship of mother. It is the most advanced method for inculcating maternal feelings. It is undeniable that as you look to the world, so the world will look to you. If the world is your mother and all its inhabitants your family, there is never need for loneliness, fear or despair. My teacher Vimalananda observed frequently when speaking of the mother. What more does one need to do once the mother has accepted him? She will do everything without being asked. She is the being to be realized.